Keys to the Commonwealth, a podcast where we share the real stories of local community members who are using real estate to build personal wealth, along with tips and tricks from professionals across the industry. And now, your host, Landry Fields. Welcome back to another episode of the Keys to the Commonwealth podcast. Uh, I'm joined today by Joseph Back of Rapid Fire uh, Investments. Is Rapid Fire Investments, I think? Yeah, Rapid Fire Investments, Rapid Fire Home Buyers. Home Buyers, yep. Uh, obviously, I, we've been kind of friends for a little bit online. Never really had much uh, together kind of conversations, but uh, seeing you around a lot on obviously, you know, uh, social media. Uh, you've done a lot more YouTube and social video stuff lately, obviously. Um, but you're well known in the real estate community, obviously here, especially for the flippers and those of the kind of people that are looking to kind of probably try to do two true burrs and so forth. Um, but yeah, excited. I've uh, been wanting to have you on a long time, so I'm glad this has finally worked out. Yeah, man, I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So uh, as you know, we start out every episode, hop back in the door, and, and you kind of tell us a little bit about who you who you are. You know how you got into the real estate business to begin with at the beginning. For sure, for sure. So, yeah. born and raised in uh, Versailles, Kentucky. Yeah. So, I've uh, been around this this area my whole life. I right. uh, went to University of Kentucky and originally thought I was going to do engineering and <laughs> did some internships. And I thought I was going to do engineering too. <laughs> yeah. Right? I like, did not enjoy it. It was. <laughs> I took my first math test and I'm like, I was like good at algebra, right? Like, yeah. real good. No problem. And I took my first calculus test. It was like, nope. Yeah. Not yeah. happening. It's, uh, it's difficult. And I think I, I was chasing it mainly because I was interested in. I heard how much money engineers can make. Sure. And then I realized, well, there's this whole world of finance where you just study money yeah. and how people make money. And I was yeah. like, well, that sounds a lot more interesting. And it was a lot easier as well. Sure. So transition to finance. Um, got interested in real estate from a professor we had at UK, uh, Jonah Mitchell. He's a, okay. a broker and a property manager and rental property owner here. And he taught this one class called Intro to Real Estate really? um, outside of his, uh, his job. So he's what they call an adjunct professor. So he just teaches... One class, then it has his full-time day okay. job. Um, and so he taught a class on Wednesdays from 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m., um, two and a half hours long, one wow. day a week. And uh, he was a, quite the entertainer. Um, and it was the first time I'd, I'd gone into a class, and you know, you hear all these business professors teach, yeah. but all they really do is teach. They've never right. actually been an entrepreneur, started a business, yeah. made it big. And Jonah kind of came in. It was the first time where I saw somebody that I was – inspired by and wanted to become like. Yeah. He was a very, very you know, self-made multimillionaire, owned a bunch of rental properties, had a property manager company, owned a brokerage. Wow. And it really got me interested in that world. And so from there, got hopping on the, the bigger pockets train and, and going yeah. down that yeah. rabbit hole. Oh, I've been uh, down that rabbit hole. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm sure. And that uh, that got me interested. In, so try to get plugged in locally and you join the, the Bluegrass Real Estate Investors Facebook group. And, right. I uh, was fortunate enough to meet a, a guy by the name of Scott Pennebaker and uh, worked for him yeah. for a while uh, after I got out of um, college, kind of building a wholesale business uh, with him. Right. And um, towards the end of 2019, my uh, then fiance, now wife, got into uh, veterinary school mm-hmm. and I uh, moved down to Alabama and, and kind of started my own wholesaling and flipping company down there. Okay, so, so it originally started while you were down there in, in the Alabama market, or did you start it here remotely? I started it. Which one I started um, when I was here, I was still working for, for Scott okay. in the Lexington market, building yeah. that business, and then okay. jumped down to Alabama and started my own company in Montgomery. Gotcha. So, and that one's still going too? Yeah, yeah, still going. we got an office down there. We've got a, another office in Columbus, Georgia, and obviously I'm back here in Lexington yeah. now, which I'm really excited about, so... Getting that office growing and, and, and it's probably amazing just to sit back and see how far it's grown in such a short amount of time, right? We've been very, very fortunate. Obviously, it's been quite a hot market. I attribute a lot yeah. of success to that, but it's been a lot of fun. And it's, yeah. it's the numbers we used to dream about doing in a month, we now do in a week. So that's kind of cool. It's uh, it's been a wild ride, right? Yeah, it's something. Uh, well, that's cool. I mean, and so back to that, I don't want to kind of over uh, step that point about the college class type of thing because I it's, it's such a big part of my heart as far as why I even do the podcast, which because like, there's just, you, it, you, like you said, people would teach finance or as far as speaking about it, but it was like, here's the, and then he had this adjunct obviously class where it was like, here's how you leverage, you know, use money to leverage and leverage money to make money kind of a scenario. Yeah. And, and so he, it was like a wide eye opening experience. Oh, it was, it was phenomenal. He would bring in other guest speakers that were yeah. all like industry titans. Right. And we had, you know, Ken Sylvester, he is, he's, they call him the apartment king. He's the biggest okay. commercial broker for apartments in town. He came in and spoke about all of his success. Yeah. A lot of other real estate investors. And you're just seeing one multimillionaire after another talking about how they got wealthy in real estate. And these, you know, 
Jonah's a smart guy, but he's not an Albert Einstein uh, who's right. going to go out and ace an advanced calculus class. Yeah. He's just a guy that worked really, really hard for a long period of time and became very successful. So yeah. that got me pretty interested in real estate, just hearing all these stories. Right. And it's just, and especially the way education, I think, is going these days, I feel like there's a lot more passion, especially for the younger generation, kind of like... You know, if you if I had these tools and things oh, like YouTube goodness. or podcasts, or like I wish I would have been shown this a lot earlier Our in my life. Chat GPT, I never have to write a paper again. Oh my <laughs> goodness! <laughs> yeah, that's the whole thing. I got younger kids, and you're like, it's kind of scary. I, I, and I'm not to get off on a huge tangent, but I'm like, okay, if the if we're teaching everyone to go right here, and then we they get to like graduate in college, and now the world has moved over to here. I'm like I'm I'm like I got, I'm trying to focus on where the puck's going like you yeah, know the great bridge that gap. you know the, and figure out like what is actually and I think that's why that entrepreneurial spirit I think is such a great way of teaching people how to leverage money use money uh, be their own like boss and entrepreneur because I think chat, tools like ChatGPT are going to be those things that allow you to be uh, to do be your own boss or own business in an even greater way than the internet a lot even yeah I mean it, I think it evens the playing field so much yeah. like it narrows the difference between people that are really, really smart, hardworking, and maybe others, which is kind of scary, yeah. but it's it's really going to be a great tool. I think it's going to unleash a lot of people to become entrepreneurs and yeah. you know, self-employed. I mean, I, I totally agree that it is kind of like frightening at the same time of like yeah. where it's going. But at the same yeah. time, I'm like, I can't just ignore this. Like I, I at least yeah. need to be like, I got to educate myself. I'm like, what is happening here? And uh, because I don't want to get left behind exactly. in a, in a, from a sense of like feeling like I don't know how to you know, use, was, uh, live in the real world anymore. Know. Insurance GPT, you know, who needs agents? <laughs> it's just it's gonna... <laughs> already been talked about some different stuff, but, but yeah. So, uh, rapid fire on everything you guys do a lot of wholesaling. Mm-hmm. Um, do y'all do hard money lending? What all do, what all do y'all offer at this yeah, point? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So rapid fire. We're primarily 99% of wholesale companies. So we primarily okay. go out, we spend a lot of money on marketing to find distressed sellers mm-hmm. who want to sell their property quick and easy. Yep. And, uh, we put those properties in our contract and bring that inventory to the uh, investor marketplace and yeah. have local investors in those markets to buy those deals that are off market, discounted well below what they'd be on the MLS. Um, a, to help the seller have a much more convenient process mm-hmm. on the selling side and, and B, to provide inventory for all these investors who are clamoring for deals still right. in this market. It's crazy. And of course, that's, that's we've a lot of us know kind of been changed recently with some of the rules and regulations they're trying to come out with uh, in the central Kentucky area with like the need to... There was a lot of individuals kind of doing, you know, house, uh, not house hacking, but uh, wholesaling, wholesaling yeah. uh, on the side. There were not licensed uh, realtors kind of scenario. And talk a little bit about that, what the changes have been with that type of thing Yeah, right now. it's uh, Kentucky House Bill 62. Um, the governor passed it on March 23rd. Uh, and basically all it did was there's a statute which lays out what is the definition of brokering real estate. And before mm-hmm. I say anything, I'm not an attorney. Yep. It's just me telling you my advice on it. Not a broker. Uh, but I have a big incentive to pay attention to this. I'll tell yes. you that because my business yes. you know, <laughs> is on the tightrope of it. So right. they basically just added a bullet point to the definition of what is considered brokering, brokering real estate. And the bullet point okay. they added is um, advertising your equitable interest in a purchase contract. So whenever I sign a purchase contract to buy a property, that gives me equitable interest in that property. Yeah. So therefore, I can go out and market that equitable interest to, to buyers or assign uh, the contract. To, therefore, kind of assign the contract. Yeah. So uh, they're saying wholesale is still legal, right. but the advertising portion of it is now considered brokering real estate. So when I get a deal under contract, I now either need to have my team be licensed yeah. or go out and source a third-party licensed agent to yeah. advertise that to the investors. I see. Um, and what I'll say is they, they when they wrote the law, it was very, very broad. There's a lot of ways to interpret it right now. Sure. And one of two things are going to play out. Hopefully, the Kentucky Real Estate Commission and also Bluegrass Realtors, because this affects both levels. Hopefully they come out with some rules and ways that they plan to implement it. Yeah. So it's a lot more clear or if they don't do that in time by June 22nd, then, um, it's going to be the wild west. And the way the rules are going to come down is someone gets sued, a ruling is held on it oh, and then you got precedent. So, uh, we'll see what happens. We're definitely watching it very closely, staying yeah. in contact with both the commission and here locally, the bluegrass realtors trying to figure that out. Yeah. Uh, cause there's a lot of questions still to be answered and a very short <laughs> amount of time to get those answers. So we'll see. And so I could see both sides in the sense of like, you know, needing some kind of reassurance from a legislation slide side of things. And, you know, as we all know, legislation a lot of times can mess things up. But as like you said, but then sometimes, like I guess right now, it's potentially way too broad of a scenario. And so the interpretation is that part that kind of a... 
you can get stuck. You don't yeah. want to get stuck in the middle of that. How it's going to get implemented and what you know, what is considered advertising, right? Can yeah. I put it behind a password protected website behind a paywall? Social media. Is it be sending a text message to one person? You got to yeah. define a lot of these things. And yeah. also, one of the things they did do is by adding that bullet point that this is now considered broken real estate. Yeah. Well, now they've got to allow it, right? They've got to allow wholesale deals to be listed on the MLS because you can't say this is broken real estate, but we're not going to allow it. By considering it broken real estate, you're kind of giving it a stamp of approval. Yeah. Um, and by doing that, there's a lot of stuff with the local MLS and everything and figuring out how how are we going to list wholesale deals on MLS. What does that look like? Is it the same process? Is it different? We have a whole new lane on the MLS for just wholesale deals. Um, as I said, there's yeah. a lot to figure out yeah. and a very short amount of time to do it. So we'll see what happens. Um, I know they're working hard to, to figure that out, but Interesting. Uh, I don't think I was, I don't think I was realized it was that in depth, honestly, until you just kind of mentioned all that. We've done a lot of research cause we want to make sure we get right. 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 We don't want to get, we don't want the one that gets slapped in the wrist and, yeah. um, when it does. Right. And you want to, you want to be able to do work appropriately the way it's supposed to be done legally type of thing. But exactly. If you're not paying attention, you could easily do something that is uh, considered illegal, even if you're not trying to. 100%. <laughs> yeah. Especially in yeah. real estate and so Especially. forth. Especially. Or insurance, et cetera. Um, back to your kind of your personal investment story, though. I mean, did you start out? Uh, so that kind of got you in the interested in real estate in general and that mm-hmm. sort of with the college. But uh, what, which came first, kind of the investing in real estate or the brokering, uh, wholesaling aspect? Uh, not, um, bro- not brokering, wholesaling. Wholesaling, wholesaling yeah, aspect. kind of. Came one and the same, right? I started okay. working. Um, was that a means to an end as far as a t- – not, not not to an end. It, was that a means to kind of end to it? You know, it, wholesaling is like the best way to get yeah. access to the best deals, right? I see probably yeah. the best deals before anybody else. Now, right. I can choose to keep those or to wholesale them. Yeah. And so it definitely was a way just to for me to dive into the industry. Um, you know, my, my goal wasn't – not my goal. My plan was not to go work in – in real estate full time was just to do it on the side. Yeah. I had I had started interning uh, for a local uh, investor, Scott, like, like I mentioned, mm-hmm. and um, we started having a lot of success with with what we were doing off market with yeah. sending these mailers and stuff. And right before I graduated, I had a I had a job offer to go work in wealth wealth management. I thought that's what I was going to do, and uh, I actually already I think I'd already accepted that job offer. And then they put it in front of me, hey. We think there's a business here. We're not sure what it looks like or how it's going to work, but we'll put some money behind the marketing. Do you want to jump at it? And I was kind of like, there's never going to be a, a time in my life where it's any easier to take this jump, yeah, right? Yeah. I'm only going to have more bills, yeah. kids, a right. wife, whatever. Right now, I'm fresh out of school, very low bills. I may as well take the jump now. And so that's kind of what prompted me going into it. Yeah. And then from there, you know, once I got in there, it was all about like, it's great working this business, but my whole goal, you know, wholesaling is very, very active. I wake up every day. Our team wakes up every week with zero contracts. we got to get more that week, more that next month and so yeah. on and so forth. There's no repeat business. And so the goal is to use that active income to then go buy passive rental properties that generate that passive income that, yeah. that everybody's chasing. And so, because wholesaling is not easy. I mean, to, uh, oh, it's, to what you're saying there, I mean, people I think think it's going to be a lot easier, but I mean, just, I know even from the amount of money you got to spend per for the mailers, for whatever else your avenue yeah. you're using, it's it's a lot. Yeah, we spend millions of dollars a year on marketing, like millions. millions of lots of time going to taking pictures, yeah. figuring out, like, getting under a contract, yeah, I mean, just advertising that contract. We go out on mean, appointments. People, we, we hit like you know twenty five percent. We we get rejected three to four times. Yeah, we're going out there, so it's it's a lot of time, effort, and money. Yeah, um, yeah, it is. Uh, I applaud you for that. I mean, I don't like I said, I, it's not something I would take on for sure. I mean, of course, I'm an the idiot who like opened his own insurance agency, which it's a lot I, of work you know, too. I don't think I think so. I think you know, honestly, to the uh, to the aspect of entrepreneurship, yeah, it has such a glamorous look. Oh, I think a lot of times, yeah. but I always tell people, make I've never worked harder in my life, and yeah. I'm much I'm definitely happier. Um, but and you have to definitely kind of uh, maybe putting on the business owner's hat for a second, find ways to balance work life, you know, personal life, family life in a way that's not going to just kill you because you could easily let the business life overtake everything. Yeah, it is, it is challenging. You got to find that balance and set boundaries for yeah. sure. What's it been like kind of growing the business though, as far as stepping into the role of like being a team leader, employees and so forth like that? Anything you've learned along those lines? I know it's kind of a little oh, bit yeah. of a left field question here, but no, no, I mean, it, it's a great question because we I have learned a lot and yeah. it's crazy because you look back a year and a half, two years ago, you know, you're really focused on, you know, just operating the business, right? The X's and O's, right? Yeah. In your world, you know, selling insurance, finding yeah. clients, yeah. you know, operating on that. And when you get to a certain certain size, you know, eight, nine, ten employees, your your job 
completely changes. You go yeah. from working in the business and like operating mm-hmm. and focusing on the X's and O's to I'm I'm purely just a leader and manager of people working now. Working on the business. Exactly. Yeah. It, well, it's, it's really just the, the aspect of like the leadership and management of people. You're yeah. really just making making sure these people yeah. hit the X's and O's, have the right training, have the right attitude. Um, and it, at first it was a big struggle because it's a completely different skill set than, yes. you know, what got you here is not going to get you to the next level. It's a whole different job. I don't think, I don't think it's job. something you can just like, what, I mean, it's something you really, I don't think you can just teach it. Like you have to just yeah. have to experience it and learn it and have mentors along the way in, all, in a lot of ways, I'll be honest, in yeah. my opinion. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, I think you were part of a few kind of mastermind groups and, and have different mentors and you can read some of the stuff in books and we've got good, yeah. good nuggets out of the, some of those things, but there's nothing that can be said for whenever one of those big cultural or people problems come up, being yeah. able to call somebody who's experienced that like 10 times over yeah. and, and get how they would do their advice on how to handle it. So it's been a big learning process and a totally different job than when I first started out. So yeah. it's kind of been the, the, the growing of that. It's crazy. That's, yeah. It's an, intru- it's a different feeling for sure. And I've definitely gone through a lot of that with you know, grow my own staff and, Putting on different, and you know, they kind of become family. And you realize that they're kind of yeah. looking up to you in some ways, and you're honestly being the provider for their Scary. livelihood in a lot of ways, which is a big responsibility, honestly, yeah. in, in that sense, you know. So, it, yeah, but that's kind of a uh, a different, like I said, question out of left field there in that sense. But back to uh, kind of your personal uh, yeah. investment side of things, kind of what's that look like now as far as for you, what you have in uh, investments wise? Yeah, mainly done, done the burn model to get where we're at. So yeah. I've got about. Um, just over a hundred uh, yeah. rental units. And right. Most of those, it's all single family duplexes. I think the largest I've got is maybe a sixplex. Yeah. Uh, mainly all in Lexington, Versailles, yeah. Nicholasville, a few in Georgetown. Um, and that's kind of the nice thing, isn't it? Speak to that a little bit as far as, you know, there's different methods of investing, obviously, but then those that go more of single family homes, maybe duplex, there's a lot more flexibility I've learned in if that's your focus on what's your real estate. Because then, if you wanted to sell it, the opportunities of who you could sell to are not dictated by just real estate investor at that point versus yeah. you got a sixplex, eightplex, et cetera. That's a real estate investor. That's who's going to buy yeah. it. It's not going to be it's all based know, on a, single, income an, and, a family type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, was that purposeful in um, that sense? I would say it's, it's not really purposeful. I, I didn't I don't think okay. I bought a lot of the bigger stuff mainly just because I didn't have a lot of capital. And yeah. so the only way I could really grow was doing the burn model. Yeah. yeah. And it's hard to get a hard money loan on a $5 million apartment, <laughs> apartment complex, right? right? Much easier to get the little $100,000 hard money yeah. loan so you can then you know do the burn yeah. model over and over and over. But we're exactly. going to do a bigger point now where we can do some of those bigger deals. But yeah. that was kind of how we got to where we're at, just one, one little one crappy time. house at a time. I yeah. mean, that's where it starts, though. I yeah, mean, it really it is. does start. I mean, we you know a little bit of our story. And yeah. I mean, of course, we didn't really start with one. We somehow jumped from <laughs> zero to six. Yeah. Uh, but, which was a, obviously the, a crazy story and... Yeah, but part of that, taking that first jump and step into it, you not, I don't, I didn't know everything, but you know, surrounding myself with people and asking the questions, like, well, I can, I can figure this out, and the, yeah. I've got the at least the people like in YouTube or others like that, that I can kind yeah. of, you're going to make mistakes, but it's going to be uh, as long as we're kind of going with a wise head, and uh, you know, we try to be. I'm sure you're the same way. We, you don't want to overestimate any kind of project, yeah. or you know, you want to be very careful in your numbers and have lots of room for error in those numbers and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely want to be conservative, but yeah. also not get into that analysis paralysis. I tell people, you know, a lot of people come for advice. They've not bought a deal yet. I said, I tell them they want, they want to know books to read or courses to take. I'm like, just buy your first deal. Yeah. I, I read, I listened to every bigger pockets podcast out there. Yeah. I was, read every book and I learned more from just doing the first yes. deal than all of that stuff combined. Like, yeah. There's so much that it doesn't prepare you for and just diving in and doing that first deal opens the door and you, you learn so much and it's also just not important. You know, maybe that first deal is not a home run. Maybe yeah. it's not a triple, maybe it's not a double, maybe it's just a single, yeah. but it gets you in the game. And then from there, it's so much easier to grow. And then you know so much more like how much, how much, how long time wise things should take, yeah. how much they re- should really cost, you know, uh, quality of materials and different things because you don't want to yeah. just go in with the absolute cheapest because yeah. then you're just replacing it immediately depending on what you're doing with it. Uh, that was a lot of value, like I said, of just kind of getting in there myself on those first couple of burrs and yeah. just doing majority of the work myself that I was capable yeah. of doing. It was, but yeah, I can't, I can't, I wouldn't trade that. It was, I, I, I don't want to do it again necessarily, <laughs> but I, I wouldn't trade that because of how much we learned in that sense for sure. Um, but uh, as far as real, as far as the current market, I mean, obviously the real estate 
investment market has changed rapidly over the last you know three years since 2020 and so forth, and obviously it's gotten harder in if, at least in, in Kentucky markets because we're very, we're kind of an in, I mean you I think you would agree right we're a very insulated state for the most part in a lot of ways uh, compared to people are always moving here it's there's we're not really yeah having it. well, well, well my kind of input on that is basically whenever rates started going up in June, July of last year, mm-hmm. um, and we were hitting on all cylinders. Things were great in all three markets. Yeah. And then what we really saw was um, in our Montgomery and Columbus markets, there was a big kind of, not a big downturn, but a big drawback sure. or pullback from the investors. Um a lot mainly because we we're selling to a lot of institutional funds and hedge funds, uh-huh. they're buying in bulk, and they all within a matter of one week, all of the four big hedge funds that we like were selling to all pulled out the same week. I mean, all the point where like we had one that was buying, they're buying like thirteen houses from us. They're past due diligence, and they, they had like twenty five hundred dollars earnest money on each of them, and they just pulled the plug on all thirteen purchases. Like they're supposed to, all these are supposed to close in the next two to three weeks. All in a matter of a week, all of them pulled out. So that was pretty scary. Wow. So we really had to start selling mainly to mom and pops down there. Um, a lot of the funds they still have not come back into the fray. Yeah. But here in Lexington, it's like it's like its own little island. You know, yeah. it's got a number of things going for it. I, I tell people for every one investor we had in Montgomery, I've got ten of them clamoring for a deal in Lexington. <laughs> it, it's I mean it's it's partly because a we've got really good you know population job growth. Yeah. But then as a lot of people that come on this podcast say, we've got that urban service boundary, right? You've got yeah. Increasing demand. And you've got this artificial circle that's limiting supply. Right. Well, and you have very little supply and a lot of demand. You can't help, but prices you keep can't. going up. I mean, yeah, I know. It's, it is it's unreal, wild. even just from my own personal house, to see where in six years it's gone to. Oh, like it's, it's almost doubled, if not more. It's more than doubled. More than doubled, I bet. More than doubled, yeah. yeah. More than doubled. And I'm just like, it, it's crazy. I mean, I don't think it's sustainable for sure in that sense. And so there's got to be a correction, correcting of the market a little bit, not necessarily a crash, I don't think. In that yeah. sense, I don't think we would agree. I think we agree that I don't think there's like a, a yeah. at least in, I'm again speaking to Central Kentucky market. It's necessarily a bubble bubble, but yeah, I think you know a lot of the bubble we saw like out in Phoenix and San Diego and a lot of those markets in this last downturn, mm-hmm. a lot of them weren't necessarily because there wasn't demand for the houses. It was purely once you raise the rates to a certain point, mm-hmm. none of the the median earning person in that market couldn't qualify for a mortgage yeah. for the median household property. I think we saw, there was a guy that spoke in one of our, our masterminds. He talked about how at the peak, um, right when they started raising rates in like August, September, uh, or no, it was a little bit before that, only 17% of the population in California could qualify for a mortgage for the median priced property in the state of California. Wow. So it's not like they don't, maybe they, maybe they want to buy it, but they yeah. literally cannot get approved for a Fannie Freddie mortgage. And so well, in that situation, you can't help but prices to correct. So yeah. here in Lexington, that could happen. I think one thing we're seeing right now too is although maybe demand has come down a little bit, it's supply has also come down in the yeah. sense that people that were moving to the country just because they wanted to, because they could go buy a bigger house yeah. for a lower payment because rates were so low. Yeah. All those people are just staying home. They're like, yeah. why in the world would I sell when I got to go buy something that's half the size mm-hmm. and pay $200 more? Uh, they're all staying in their houses. They're only moving if they absolutely have to. So there's less inventory coming into the market, less demand. Yeah, people are, kind are of still moving out. here, still moving which here. is why it's still kind of, kind of exactly that, uh, still kind of making those making those uh, increases on our houses still go up yeah. at this point. So uh, and, you know, it is. It is. Well, I mean, uh, what do you think? Kind of 2020, and obviously no one knows. But where do you yeah. think? Kind of things start heading 2023 from what you all yeah are kind of looking know, at. Obviously, you kind of got to always be watching where things may be headed yeah. and so forth. Yeah, I like to, real estate's very local, right? I mean, we yeah. saw a huge downturn in the Phoenixes and you know San Diego's of the world last year. Here in Kentucky and Lexington, prices have kept going up. So it's it's very local. I think for Lexington, I don't see anything really changing. And yeah. until they open up that urban service boundary, it's going to be very difficult for us to see a big correction because yeah. there's just a big pent-up amount of demand and they cannot build the houses fast enough. And from what I understand, it's going to be a while before that even potentially happens because they yeah. think that just took a vote to not expand it. Is that correct? I think so. I'm and not super caught up on it. From what I understand, it uh, it was it usually takes about five years, even if they made that decision, to really kind of see the effect of that. Yeah. And that decision has been uh, that vote would not be happen again for another five years. And yeah. so we're looking at potentially even ten years before we really see the effects of the potential expansion of yeah. that at all. So. 
I mean, who knows what's going to happen in the next 10 years in that sense. And, and, and with that aspect in mind, I mean, I, and people still moving here, I mean, it might not really slow down. I mean, it probably slows down, but it's like, I don't think it's going to bubble pop, pop type of scenario I don't think for, it for at least pop. a while. Yeah, a while. I don't see that either. I think what we are seeing is a lot of booms in you know, the suburb cities, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, Nicholasville is the new Lexington, right? It, right. You know, they're building tons and tons of new homes in Nicholasville, and yeah. the demand's there to fill it because it's it's the only city – you know, that buds up the Lexington where the urban service, urban service boundary goes all the way up to the county line. Yeah. So it's basically just become an extension. So <laughs> a lot of these, these, these markets that are, yeah. you know, Richmond, um, you know, Georgetown, obviously they're yeah. growing like crazy because all that demand can't go anywhere else. So they're going to these suburb cities and, and working in Lexington. Yeah. And I, I love those suburb cities. I know they want to have their own identity of like, we are Nicholasville, we are Winchester, we are Richmond, we yeah. are for sales, uh, et cetera. But it's kind of, I think you definitely see the picture is starting to procure into more of like, when you think of Lexington, really you have to start thinking about the other towns immediately around it that yep. you never really did that before. Uh, kind of like, like, you know, Louisville, yeah. et cetera is. I mean, you start, you don't just think of like just the downtown Jefferson yeah, County yeah, yeah. at that point. Indiana is you Louisville. You see yeah, Louisville. You see. Like, <laughs> exactly. And a lot of those other counties around it and so forth. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting. I don't think it's slowing down like you're saying, and uh, it's going to be interesting 2023 for a year. And obviously, I mean, it's made it harder on the Burr method model, especially yeah. with rates at this point. It has. Um, but you all are still seeing success. Obviously, there's still, as you mentioned, in this market, you know, a whole lot more buyers per one person compared to your other markets then. Yeah, I think here we're seeing a lot more flipping activity, right? Yeah. Um, a lot of the people that really are doing true burrs and really trying to get good cash flow have migrated to the to, Harrisburgs and Danvilles, yeah. and they've gone way far out. Yeah. So we're still selling inventory to them in those places. Yeah. And a lot of people that are doing the burr here, which is I'm still doing the burr strategy in Lexington. Yeah. I'm not even trying necessarily to, to cash flow. I'm trying to have it break even to maybe $50 a month. Yeah. As long as I have no money in the deal, right. every one of those I do is just like a little forced saving account. Which is crazy that even fifty dollars a month, because most people think like, oh, you're gonna have a rental property, you're gonna cash flow. I, I think that's a, a common misconception, right? Yeah. I'm gonna have a rental property. I'm gonna make a bunch of cash on a monthly basis. You're like, no, no, you never no, make cash not. flow. It just keeps you in the game. The yeah. real return comes that debt pay down yes. and appreciation. Like, and that's what the whole mindset has to be. I mean, yeah. I can't be unless you're wanting to go all in, creating a huge network of. Or not network, but a huge portfolio of yeah. properties. That's when you're going to really start seeing a cash flow scenario. That's a maybe a huge passive income for you. Maybe that switches to your career. But I mean, I knew we were like just ecstatic that we were able to get about two hundred fifty dollars a door originally. Yeah. You know, before rates started just climbing the way they are were type of thing. And so. Yeah. I and it's two hundred fifty dollars a door. Theoretically, you theoretically. have one HVAC go out. Yes. There goes your cash flow for the whole year, yes. right? Yes. And that's the hard part about rentals is until you have a huge portfolio yeah. where the other ones can kind of pay for that HVAC or that roof or yeah. that hot water heater. You know, it's very hard to cash flow unless you really do a true burn, right. fix all those big systems in the front end. But kind of like what I was talking about with like you know us having employees and so forth. I mean, if unless you're hiring out a property manager, which I mean, obviously you can, but I mean, you're still kind of you're married to someone's livelihood yeah. from a living standpoint in a big way that are still relying on you at the same time. Yeah. And I don't think people probably going into it at owning real estate, think about that either. They don't. Yeah. You get a lot of, I still, I'm still so stressed out by just all the people that work for us that yeah. I feel responsible for. But on that side too, yeah, you're providing a, a home to many, many families. Yeah. So it's, and when, it, <laughs> when you're involved with people, it's, it's always going to be messy and as it is. Any, at some point it's always going to be messy and how we handle that. Uh, and have systems and processes and stick systems to them. And processes. It's hard to, people give you a lot of sad, you know, sob stories, yeah. but you got to keep to those systems and processes. The systems, processes, and I would say goals. So what are yeah. some of your goals that you're, you're kind of hoping for? Yeah. Down the road? Yeah. You know, this year um, we've got our three offices. Our mm-hmm. Columbus, Georgia office is our, our newest. It's a little smaller, but okay. we're growing it really well, really well. Where's Columbus, Georgia? It's, um, it's about an hour and a half southwest from uh, Atlanta. It's right on the okay. uh, kind of Georgia, um, Alabama line. Okay. It's about the same size as uh, as Montgomery, about 400,000 metro population. Okay. The big kind of employer there is Fort Benning. They're a yes. massive employer. Yeah, yeah, there. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of what I know a lot of military. Um, but we got it down there. The goal this year is open a fourth office sometime in Q3, Q4. Okay. I'm not exactly sure where yet. Maybe Cincinnati, maybe yeah. Louisville. May go down to Birmingham. Um, we're still kind of right. figuring that out. Um, and then um, our goal this year is to you know, buy and sell uh, 485 houses. So we did 
300 last year. Okay. I'm trying to really grow that this year. So uh, the markets responded well. Yeah. Um, all three of our offices were seeing a lot of buyer demand um, in in this towards the end of Q1, and especially right now in Q2. Yeah. Um, we're hoping that continues. And uh, yeah, that's kind of our goals. And it's on the rental side. Uh, the goal this year is to buy about 50 new rentals. We're yeah. really trying to say 50. Yeah, trying to buy a lot more this year. I'd okay. Kind of, we I sold a bunch last year, so uh, okay. I, I, we we heard some economic forecast. Yeah. In like Q1, Q2, and I got pretty concerned about where things were going to head. Yeah. The rates going up, and so we, I talked to, talk to some guys who who've been through you know the 2008s, 2009s. I was like, man, what would you do right now? What yeah. what happened then? Yeah. That I can talk to you about, maybe learn some lessons and not sure. have to experience it. And their advice was. When that, when, that, when that recession happened, the A-class and B-class properties got hit a little bit. They didn't do too bad. But all those C and D-class properties that have doubled in value, they went basically to zero. They really, really fell off a cliff. I and see. So I had a lot of fairly C-class multifamily in Frankfurt okay. and in Richmond, and they had basically doubled in value since I bought them, and I hadn't really done anything. Yep. So I was like, you know what? This is time to cash out. And we sold about... I think sold about 50 units last year. Yeah. Um, okay. And now I'm really focused on buying like B class single family okay. rentals in Lexington. So yeah. that's the goal is to buy a lot more of those. Hard to come by, but when we find them, we, we hard to come buy. by. <laughs> you would know more than me. I mean, it seems like I, I mean I know. Yeah, it's hard to come by. You see something on posted on the Facebook group or whatever. It's oh, yeah. you know it's gone or and, there's people just buying it sight unseen. Like they don't even care. Oh, like I'll buy it. You know, I mean, right I now, think um, especially if it's a Lexington deal for a yeah. wholesale business. Yeah. About. I would say about 70, 80% go sight unseen, full asking within 60 minutes. Wow. So, I mean, <laughs> I was going to lead into my next point as far as uh, to kind of close this out was the ex- buying experience. So, I mean, if someone's purchasing a house, obviously there's an email list, you know, I yeah. get some of those emails where you say, hey, here's a, a property that's for sale, something like that. So, walk through from on my end side of things if I was going to buy a property from you all, kind of what that exper- that looks like. For sure, yeah, especially here in Lexington. Um, we've got we've got Andy on our team who's our investment sales specialist. Mm-hmm. His job is all day to be networking with investors like yourself, yeah. figuring out what you're looking for. Uh, but if you want to get on the list, basically you go to rapidfireinvestments.com. Mm-hmm. There'll be a sign-up section. Once you sign up, Andy's going to reach out to you find out, you know, are you a flipper? Are you a, a buy and hold rental property? Are you looking for Airbnbs? What yeah. cities are you looking at? What price points? What do you need help with, right? And a lot of people don't know, but we've got a pretty extensive list of kind of what we call our local uh, preferred partners for everything from property management to general contractors, yeah. insurance, yeah. Um, and anything else you need. We, we try to, lenders, we try to help you with that. Yeah. Remove any barrier that's going to prevent you from buying a deal from us. And then from there, when we get a new deal, we send an email blast out, there's a text blast that goes out, and then it gets posted to our website. And so it's about just being on top of your email and text and responding That's, ASAP. I'm sure you know a lot of times as soon as I hit this button, we're going to start getting either phone calls or emails <laughs> oh, yeah. or texts and stuff like that yeah. a lot of times. Oh, yeah. It's uh, it's a lot of deals within the first five minutes, he'll, Andy will get blown up. If it's, yeah. you know, if it's like a 3-2 brick ranch in Lexington, it's, it's game done. over. Yeah, it's, it's done. It's done. <laughs> That's not falling apart. but Exactly. I mean, at least from a structural standpoint. Yeah. But even then, I know I mean, some even people then, will still oh. be able to I don't have the guts to We had one that had like that mold yet. in last week, had mold in the walls, the ceiling was completely black. Yeah. The mold was so bad that the floors had fallen away from like the joist. Like they, like you walked in, the floors were like six inches lower than they're supposed to be. Went sight unseen, full asking within ten minutes oh over an idle hour. Oh my gosh! Because yeah, location can make it make a big it, yeah, factor, obviously, in that sense. So, uh, but yeah. So, what was the website again? One more time. Uh, rapidfireinvestments.com. You go okay. there. You can you can sign up, but you can also, if you want, you, there's a little deals tab. You can see all of our currently active deals okay. um, in the Kentucky market, or if you're looking to buy in yeah. Alabama or Georgia, they're on there as well. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, I have not explored outside of areas that I already know. So yeah. I might have to start working. I mean, Montgomery's got good cash flow, very cheap it? properties. Wouldn't say the population is necessarily growing that much, but yeah. it's very stable. We sell three bed, two bath brick ranches for 70 to 90,000 that rent for a thousand to 1100 all day long. Nice. It's a well, different market, but I might have to look at that then. there you go. So, well, cool. Joseph, appreciate you coming on the show. Um, as far as any kind of uh, finding properties, definitely check out their website or if I can help you out with anything uh, insurance related, by all means, give me a call. 859-687-2004. And we will see you all back next week. Thanks, Joseph, for coming on the show. Thank you. Bye. To learn more about this podcast, visit our page at keystothecommonwealth.com. To connect with Landry regarding insuring your investment portfolio, email Landry at novainsurancegroup.com 
or call 859-687-2004.